क्लास टेंथ हिस्ट्री चैप्टर नंबर वन द राइज ऑफ नेशनलिज्म इन यूरोप इन 1848 फ्रेडरिक सोरी अ फ्रेंच आर्टिस्ट प्रिपेयर्ड ए सीरीज ऑफ फोर प्रिंट्स विजुअलाइजिंग हिज ड्रीम ऑफ ए वर्ल्ड मेडअप ऑफ डेमोक्रेटिक एंड सोशल रिपब्लिक्स एज ही कॉल्ड देम द फर्स्ट प्रिंट फिगर वन ऑफ द सीरीज shows the peoples of europe and america men and women of all ages and social classes marching in a long train and offering homage to the statue of liberty as they pass by it as you would recall artist of the time of the french revolution personified liberty as a female figure here you can recognize the torch of enlightenment she bears in one hand and the charter of the rights of man in the other on the earth in the foreground of the image lie the shattered remains in the symbols of absolutist institutions in sore's utopian vision the peoples of the world are grouped as distinct nations identifying identified through their flags and national outcome leading the procession way past the statue of liberty are the united states and switzerland which by this time were already nation states france identifiable by the revolutionary tricolor had just reached had just reached the statue she is followed by the peoples of germany bearing the black red and gold flag Interestingly at the time when Suri created this image the German peoples did not yet exist as a united nation the flag they carry is an expression of liberal hopes in 1848 to unify the numerous german speaking principalities into a nation state under a democratic constitution following the german peoples are the peoples of austria the kingdom of two silesia Lombardy, Poland, England, Ireland, Hungary and Russia. From the heavens above, Christ saints and angels gaze upon the scene. They have been used by the artist to symbolize fraternity among the nations of the world. This chapter will deal with many of the issues visualized by Sore in figure 1. During the 19th century, nationalism emerged as a force which brought about sweeping changes in the political and mental world of europe the end result of these changes was the emergence of the nation state in place of the multinational dynastic empires of europe the concept and practices of modern state in which a centralized power exercises sovereign control over a clearly defined territory had been developing over a long period of time in europe but a nation state was one in which the majority of its citizens and not only its rulers came to develop a sense of common identi- identity and shared history to descent this commonness did not exist from time immemorial it was forced through struggles through the action of leaders and the common people This chapter will look at the diverse process through which nation states and nationalism came into being a 19th century Europe. New words absolutist literally a government or system of rule that has no restraints on the power exercised. In history the term refers to a form of monarchical government that was centralized militarized and repressive utopian a vision of society that is so ideal that it is unlikely to actually exist plebiscite a direct vote by which all the people of a region are asked to accept or reject a proposal source a ernest renan what is a nation in a lecture in a lecture delivered at the university of sorbonne in 
the French philosopher Ernest Renan, 1823-92, outlined his understanding of what makes a nation. The lecture was subsequently published as a famous essay entitled Quest Se Quen Nation. What is a nation? In this essay, Renan criticizes the notion suggested by others that a nation is formed by a common language, race, religion or territory. A nation is the culmination of a long past of endeavors, sacrifice and devotion. A heroic past, great men, glory, that is the social capital upon which one bases a national idea. To have common glories in the past, to have a common will in the present, to have performed great deeds together, to wish to perform still more. These are the essential conditions of being a people. A nation is therefore a large-scale solidarity. Its existence is a daily plebiscite. A province is its inhabitants. If anyone has the right to be consulted, it is the inhabitant. A nation never has any real interest in annexing or holding on to a country against its will. The existence of nations is a good thing, a necessity even. Their existence is a guarantee of liberty, which would be lost if the world had only one law and only one master. First point, the French Revolution and the idea of the nation. The first clear expression of nationalism came with the French Revolution in 1789. France, as you would remember, was a full-fledged territorial state in 1789 under the rule of an absolute monarch. The political and the constitutional changes that came in the wake of the French Revolution led to the transfer of sovereignty from the monarchy to a body of French citizens. The revolution proclaimed that it was the people who would henceforth constitute the nation and shape, shape its destiny. From the very beginning, the French revolutionaries introduced various measures and practices that could create a sense of collective identity amongst the French people. The idea of la patrie, the fatherland, and la citoyen, the citizen, emphasized the notion of a united community enjoying equal rights under a constitution. A new French flag the tricolor was chosen to replace the former royal standard. The state's general was elected by the body of active citizens and renamed the National Assembly. New hymns were composed, oaths taken, and martyrs commemorated, all in the name of the nation. A centralized administrative system was put in place and it formulated uniform laws for all citizens within its territory. Internal customs duties and dues were abolished, and a uniform system of weights and measures was adopted. Regional dialects were discouraged, and French, as it was spoken and written in Paris, became the common language of the nation. The revolutionaries further declared that it was the mission and the destiny of the French nation to liberate the people of Europe from of Europe from despotism in other words to help other peoples of Europe to become nations when the news of the events in France reached the different cities of Europe students and other members of educated middle classes began setting up jacobin clubs their activities and campaigns prepared the way for the french armies with moved into Holland, Belgium, Switzerland, and much of Italy in the 1790s. With the outbreak of revolutionary wars, the French armies began to carry the idea of nationalism abroad. Within the wide swath of territory that came under his control, Napoleon set about introducing many of the reforms that he had already introduced in France. Through a return to monarchy, Napoleon, Napoleon had no doubt 
destroyed democracy in France. But in the administrative field, he had incorporated revolutionary principles in order to make the whole system more rational and efficient. The Civil Code of 1804, usually known as the Napoleonic Code, did away with all privileges based on birth, established equality before the law, and secured the right to property. This code was exported to the regions under French control. In the Dutch Republic, in Switzerland, in Italy and Germany, Napoleon simplified administrative divisions, abolished the feudal system and freed peasants from serfdom and manorial dues. In the towns too, guild restrictions were removed, transport and communication system were improved. Peasants, artisans, workers and new businessmen enjoyed a newfound freedom. Businessmen and small scale producers of goods in particular began to realize that uniform laws, standardized weights and measures and a common national currency would facilitate the movement and exchange of goods and capital from one region to another. However, in the areas conquered, the reactions of the local population to French rule were mixed. Initially, in many places such as Holland and Switzerland, as well as in certain cities like Brussels, Mainz, Milan and Warsaw, the French armies were welcomed as harbingers of liberty. But the initial enthusiasm soon turned to hostility as it became clear that the new administrative arrangements did not go hand in hand with political freedom. Increased taxation, censorship, forced conscription into the French armies required to conquer the rest of Europe all seemed to outweigh the advantages of the administrative changes. Figure 4. The planting of tree of liberty in Jebrecken, Germany. The subject of this color print by the German painter Karl Kasper Fritz is the occupation of the town of Jebrecken by the French armies. French soldiers, recognizable by their blue, white and red uniforms, have been portrayed as oppressors as they seize of peasant's cart left. Harris some young woman center for ground and force a peasant down to his knees. The plague being affixed to the tree of liberty carries a German inscription which in translation reads Take freedom and equality from us, the model of humanity. This is a sarcastic reference to the claim of the French as being liberators who opposed monarchy in the territories they entered. Figure 5 The courier of Greenland losses all that he has on his way home from Leipzig. Napoleon here is represented as a postman on his way back to France after he lost the Battle of Leipzig in 1813. Each letter dropping out of his bag bears the names of the territories, territories he lost. Point 2. The Making of Nationalism in Europe If you look at the map of mid-18th century, Europe we will find that there were no nation-states as we know them today. What we know today as Germany, Italy and Switzerland were divided into kingdoms duchies and cantons whose rulers had their autonomous territories. Eastern and Central Europe were under autocratic monarchies within the territories of which lived diverse peoples. They did not see themselves as sharing a collective identity or a common culture. Often they even spoke different languages and belonged to different ethnic groups. The Habsburg Empire that ruled over Austria, Hungary, for example, was a patchwork of many different regions and peoples. It included the Alpine regions, the Tyrol, Austria, and the Sudetenland, as well as Bohemia, where the aristocracy was predominantly German speaking. It also included the Italian speaking provinces of Lombardy and Venetia. In Hungary, 
half of the population spoke magyar while the other half spoke a variety of dialects in in galicia the aristocracy spoke polish besides these three dominant groups there also lived within the boundaries of the empire a mass of subject peasant peoples bohemians and slovaks to the north slovens in carniola croats to the south and rumans to the east in transvilenia such differences did not easily promote a sense of political unity the only tie binding these diverse groups together was a common allegiance to the emperor how did nationalism and the idea of the nation state emerge 2.1 the aristocracy and the new middle class socially and politically a landed aristocracy was the dominant class on the continent the members of this class were united by a common way of life that cut across regional divisions they owned estates in the countryside and also town houses they spoke french for purposes of diplomacy and in high society their families were often connected by ties of marriage this powerful aristocracy was however numerically a small group the majority of the population was made up of the peasantry to the west the bulk of the land was farmed by tenants and small owners while in eastern and central europe the pattern of land holding was characterized by vast estates which were cultivated by serfs in western and parts of central europe the growth of industrial production and trade meant the growth of towns and the emergence of commercial classes whose existence was based on production for the market industrialization began in england in the second half of the 18th century but in france and parts of the german states it occurred only during the 19th century in its wake new social groups came into being a working class population and middle classes made up of industry industrialists businessmen professionals in central and eastern europe these groups were smaller in number till the till late 19th century it was among the it was among the educated liberal middle classes that ideas of national unity following the abolition of aristocratic privileges gained popularity 2.2 what did liberal nationalism stand for ideas of national unity in early 19th century europe were closely allied to the ideology of liberalism the term liberalism derives from the latin root liber meaning free for the new middle classes liberalism stood for freedom for the individual and equality of all before the law politically it emphasized the concept of government by consent since the french revolution liberalism had stood for the end of autocracy and clerical privileges a constitution and representative government through parliament 19th century liberals also stressed in viability of private property yet equality before the law did not necessarily stand for universal suffrage you will recall that in revol- in revolutionary france which marked the first political experiment in liberal democracy the right to vote and to get elected was granted exclusively to property owning men men without property and all women were excluded from political rights only for a brief period under the jacobins did all adult males enjoy suffrage however the napoleonic napoleonic code went back to limited suffrage and reduced women to the status of a minor subject to the authority of fathers and husbands throughout the 19th and the early 20th centuries women and non propertied men organized opposition movements 
डिमांडिंग इक्वल पॉलिटिकल राइट्स